Recently, I just made a, a video um, after doing some research on Michael Shank's book, Muscle and a Shovel. I had come across some of his comments um, in Amazon concerning um, replies to reviews of his work. One such work uh, was done in the past, not too long ago, called Muscle and a Shovel, a Review by one of his own um, members of his Church of Christ Restorationist Group movement. Um, this particular author had a, a lot of negative criticism and I shared with you in the previous video um, where Michael Shank jumped on Amazon and shared his thoughts and admitted to errors and flaws in the work. Uh, and you can see that video for full documentation on that um, reporting that I did on that to inform the community about what was going on about this work and why asking the question why was it still being promoted when the author himself seemed to be dissing it in public. Uh, little did I know or really expect that within um, a day or so, Michael Shank himself would jump on my reporting on the video and comment concerning what I had said in the video. Uh, you can go back to the, uh, the original video to read that for yourself, but I'll just read it for you here and respond to what he wanted me to respond to and offer some further investigation that I was able to do um, after reading some things from Muscle and a Shovel, a review and point out that there are some serious concerns still about Michael Shank's work. This is Michael Shank's reply to my video scoop. Hi Paul, maybe I can answer your video in a direct way. Honestly, I don't understand why you didn't come to me, and he cites Matthew 18, 15 through 18 as a um, precedent I'm supposed to follow on this apparently. But that's your prerogative. Uh, no, Mr. Shank, uh, you are abusing the scriptures here. Uh, Matthew eighteen fifteen through 18 deals with how uh, members of the church are to respond to each other should one um, be sinned against. In no way am I saying that you, as an individual, has sinned against me personally. And this passage has nothing whatsoever to do with this. Sir, you wrote this as a public work, and as a public work is going to receive a public response and critique. That's all that this boils down to. And your attempt to hide behind Scripture, um, to um, provide some sort of protection in this, in this issue, um, is shocking. It's stunning. But when we go and read your work and how you exegete scripture, honestly, I'm not surprised. This is just more of the same. You go on to say, yes, the book is flawed and has many errors, but you're assuming that flaws and errors are lies. That seems to be the case. It is flawed because it is not a work of inspiration. It has errors. There are grammatical errors, typos too numerous to count, but the story isn't a lie. Mr. Shank, I'm not saying your story is a lie, but however, uh, concerning your comments on Muscle and a Shovel, a review, the flaws and errors that you admitted to were in response to this writer's critique of your work, and in no way did the author accuse you of typos. Mr. Shank, he accused you of very serious historical and exegetical errors, and that's what your comments referred to. And my concern is that since you were directly called out on these uh, historical and exegetical errors, um, that you continue to promote the book. You don't provide footnotes um, addressing criticism, saying, yes, what, what's been said here is correct, I need to correct this. Um, it's very concerning. And to me, that questions your motives. And it makes me wonder what you're really about here. And 
we will keep on looking at that here in just a little bit in the video to document uh, how that you do have errors in your book of historical nature and you will not acknowledge them and you will not correct the issue. You go on to say, I happily confess that I myself am a flawed man. That is a point. To prove the point, when Shovel's Break is a sequel and it is the volume where I confess my sins for world consumption, my adultery, alcoholism, drug use and abuse, lust, lies, etc., all of it. Listen, let me ask you a sincere question. Do you know anyone who has written and published their entire life of sins? Yes, sir, Mr. Shank, I've seen plenty of them. Here's another point I would appreciate your thoughts on. Why has God blessed this work? It was released in 2011 and continues to remain in the top 100 Amazon evangelism books. Why? Well, it's not because I'm some incredible writer. It's not because I have a great talent. God chose to bless this work. It has always been beyond me. The Lord might destroy the work tomorrow or it might continue on. It's not up to me and never will be. Um, I'm concerned, Mr. Shank, that uh, when you face criticism, you immediately run to stats, book sales, um, as though that's some indication that you have divine favor and warrant to continue doing what you're doing. Sir, if you claim to be the type of Bible student that you are, and supposedly that Randall taught you to be, there are numerous stories in the Bible that tell us that just because you have a crowd doesn't make you right. This is a basic, logical, and scriptural um, problem that you have fell into and I really do not see how you can justify it. Numbers do not equate success, and they never will. What matters is truth, and does it honor God in the process? The only other part here in your comment, I'm not for sure how you, being a member of the Restoration Movement, would even dare to say that God chooses to bless your work. Um, sir, that is a statement of Calvinism. Uh, you really need to check your theology. If your elders find out, I'm sure they would be willing to excommunicate you. And it's just that serious. Now, what I want to do here in the rest of this response is to prove, um, based on mainly your historical research, that what you have done is extremely faulty, it's irresponsible, and it shows the height of arrogance that even when you are called out on this, you will not address it permanently. You allow uh, um, your comments to remain hidden in the public view, hoping nobody will see it. But you continue to sell that book. Let's walk through some of this stuff, shall we please? The biggest problems here that I have noticed in this work are the historical issues and we'll pull it up here out of Kindle and we will address this directly as the reviewer a muscle and a shovel a review goes into he states here that muscle and a shovel contains some serious historical errors they are serious because they are part of the argument to persuade and to the extent that there are inaccuracies, this detracts from the validity of the point, as the author sees it. Historical inaccuracies, even unintentional mistakes, are not only unfair and misleading, but they also create suspicion in the minds of readers. That would be something to greatly consider. If you have to manipulate history, cut out history, um, present it in the way that you want to present it to make your point. That provides a very poor reflection on where your exegetical arguments are going to go. And it's something that needs to be addressed, Mr. Shank. In general, the historical allusions in Muscle and a Shovel are misleading, inaccurate, or incomplete. 
some of these that were brought up in Muscle and a Shovel or Review are over about four basic points. One of them is the idea that Baptists all over the place teach that John the Baptist started the Baptist Church. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard that repeated to me, but nothing can be further from the truth. The author goes on to say that, Mr. Shank, your understanding is inaccurate. There is indeed a small segment of the Baptist tradition that still makes secessionist claims. However, it is a minority, and it does not represent Baptist as a whole. Whatever you heard from some Baptist pastors was not, especially in 1988, standard Baptist teaching. Baptists believe that Jesus Christ founded the church and that Jesus is the only head of the church. To, have, to leave any other impression as part of the argument for the truth is misleading, Mr. Shank, as the author leaves here. The second historical problem that this review um, cites you for concerns your comments on infant baptism. You charge that the uh, King James Version translated uh, baptizo, the Greek word, as baptized in an effort to avoid and get around the issue of it meaning immerse or to dip. However, historically, this is not the case. For example, the writer uh, notes here that in the Tyndall New Testament of uh, 1526, uh, Tyndale uh, translated baptizo um, as uh, baptized a century before the King James Version was produced. In fact, it was a standard practice among English translations at that time before the KJV. Also, uh, Robert uh, Caldry's English Dictionary of 1604 gives the first definition for baptized as dipping. Also, um, uh, in England, in both the Roman Catholic Communion and Anglican Communions, they practiced immersion more than they did sprinkling or pouring in the time of the uh, translation of the KJV. Also, in, even in the Eastern churches, they still immerse infants in water. And the Church of England often immersed infants in the 16th and 17th century. In fact, the first edition of the Book of Common Prayer of 1549 dictates immersion for infants unless they are weak. The argumentation here is extremely poor and has been refuted in detail in this work. Mr. Shank, why have you not acknowledged it? Why have you not changed it? Perhaps you really are lying. This next one... I take very strong issue with because uh, your comments concerning Calvinism or Reformed theology are extremely poor. They are caricatures of what I believe, what Reformed theology states. And this documents from the Campbellite perspective, this review does, how um, your efforts here to define what we believe actually severely undermine your own cause. You claim in your book, In Muscle and Shovel, that you spent hours at your local library studying denominationalism, and you discovered that almost every denomination was influenced by Calvinism. However, historically, this simply isn't the case. Almost every denomination was influenced by Calvinism is not true. They have not all been influenced by TULIP. One thing that you go on to state is that John Calvin wants you and I to believe that innocent babies who die before they come to age, whereby they understand the right from wrong, are actually going to be eternally damned. From your, This is a quote from your book. Actually, when you go back and dig up what Calvin actually said, Calvin said the exact opposite. From uh, the Presbyterian and Reformed Review, I everywhere teach that no one can be justly condemned in Paris except on account of actual sin. And to say that the countless mortals taken from life while yet infants are precipitated from their mother's arms into eternal death is blasphemy. 
to be universally detested. That doesn't uh, jive with your comments, Mr. Shank. Furthermore, uh, in the Institutes, uh, uh, concerning comments on John 3, 36, Christ does not there speak of the general guilt in which all the posterity of Adam are involved, but only threatens the despisers of the gospel, who proudly and contumously spurn the grace that is offered to them. But this has nothing to do with infants. Everyone whom Christ blesses is exempted from the curse of Adam and the wrath of God, Therefore, seeing it is certain that infants are blessed by him, it follows that they are freed from death. Mr. Shank, you struck out big on this one. Also, your comments on eternal security um, and perseverance of the saints uh, were troubling. And um, you seem to want to merge this with the uh, idea of once saved, always saved. Um, one of these is actually Calvinistic doctrine, the perseverance of the saints, which affirms that all the elect will persevere in faith by the power of God. And the other is uh, the doctrine of eternal security that affirms that if one has ever truly believed, then they are eternally saved. But the once saved, always saved version of it um, claims that you can simply stop believing and still go to heaven. The, uh, the former is actual Calvinism, but the latter is a more recent vintage that influenced many Baptist churches through Darby and Schofield dispensationalism. The latter is technically called once saved, always saved, as mentioned before. Calvinism does not believe one can live like hell since that does not manifest authentic faith. The perseverance of the saints affirms that God will persevere the elect in the faith. That is, believers will continue to grow and mature in faith as they exhibit the evidence of God's work in their life through good works. Calvinists do not believe one can live like hell and be saved. Again, this is a major strikeout, Mr. Shane. Why do you continue to publish this? All this is documented in Muscle and Shovel, a review. What you commented on. You admitted you had flaws and errors. You still promote it. Why? Another uh, issue here, um, your comments on the uh, origin of instrumental music in um, the history of the church. You say in your book, early in the Reformation movement, all the denominations that came out of Catholicism, Anabaptist, Baptist movement, Lutherans, Calvinism, Presbyterians, Methodism, Mennonites, etc., sang a cappella, that is, without instrumental music. Uh, none of the denominations used instruments. All of them were in unanimous agreement. They believed the instruments of music were idolatry and were not to be allowed in worship, end quote. The review goes on to state here, with all due respect, that statement is simply wrong. Randall suggests that the Roman Catholic Pope Vitalian first introduced instruments in 660 AD, and that the Protestant opposition early in the Reformation was part of the anti-Catholic polemic as well as a return to biblical practice. Uh, this date is inaccurate. We know from history, um, even though it is disputed, it could go back further, uh, at least 200 years before 660, the organ was introduced in Spain. Again, you are wrong in your use of history. Also, uh, during the Reformation, there were two different approaches to the use of instrumental music. One tradition, primarily the Reformed Calvinistic tradition, was for a cappella. The other, the Lutherans and the Anglicans, were instrumental. Now, your comments on Luther here are um, something that is popular among Kabbalites. Uh, it's misinformation, it's hearsay, and it needs to be recanted. Regarding your Luther quote, this quote from Luther is nowhere found in Luther's writings. Nowhere. It's based on hearsay, on secondhand reports. In contrast, there is clear evidence that Luther embraced instrumental music in worship. In fact, when Karl Stott, a proto-reformed advocate, attempted to implement some thesis of this kind in Luther's absence 
while he was in exile in, in, the, in the time of Wittenberg, he tried to include the banning of polyphonic and instrumental music. Later, Luther returned to stop what Karl Stott was doing, and um, there are other Luther quotes that show that he was for the use of instrumental music. Uh, there are several here given in the review. I'm going to read them so everybody else knows what they are because this is a common Campbellite argument and they will not stop using it. The string instruments of the Psalms are to help in the singing of this new psalm and Wolf Hines and all pious Christian music musicians shall let their singing and playing to the praise of the Father of all grace sound forth with joy from their organs. Symphonias, virginials, regals and whatever other beloved instruments there are recently invented and given by god of which neither david nor solomon neither persia greece nor rome knew anything in his comments on psalm 4 luther wrote to prince uh, Joachim of anhalt on june the 16th of 1534 so elijah was awakened by his minstrel and david himself declares in psalm 57 that his harp was his pride and joy. Awake up, my glory, awake, psaltery and harp. And all the saints made themselves joyful with psalms and stringed instruments. Also in his lectures on Isaiah, he said, Certainly if you would make use of music as David did, you will not sin. Doesn't match your comments, Mr. Shank. Also, um... He goes on to say that the words should be read, sung, preached, written, and set in poetry. Whatever it may be helpful and beneficial, I should gladly have it rung out all by, by all bells and played on all organ pipes and proclaimed by everything that makes a sound. Something to consider. Um, the review goes on to state here more details of the Church of England also used instruments in worship until Queen Elizabeth. There were some efforts to try and change that to go to a more Puritan direction, the Calvinist direction that ultimately failed in England. Um, now, the comments about Methodism and John Wesley, this is also something used by a lot of Campbellites and needs to be addressed, so I will address it directly from Muscle and Shovel at Review because it's very good and accurate here. Methodists led by John Wesley, um, the lay movement from the Church of England, they had small groups starting off with at first due to um, how they were organized, and during those times they did sing a cappella in those small groups. But it was not a question of conviction about the legitimacy of instruments, but it was more about the circumstances of their meetings. Later, when they established churches in England, they often placed organs in the churches. Uh, there's a quote here in Muscle and a Shovel that's attributed to Randall from John Wesley. It's never been located anywhere. Um, it can only be traced back to Adam Clark in his Clark's Commentary. Um, in contrast to what uh, Clark supposedly said about what John Wesley said about instruments, Wesley was actually for instrumental music. Here's two quotes. We had a large and serious congregation at the new church both morning and afternoon. The organ is one of the finest toned I have ever heard, and the congregation singing with it make a sweet harmony. John Wesley, the Journal of Reverend John Wesley. Also, um, their hymn book is called, from that time period, Sacred Harmony, or Choice Collection of Psalms and Hymns, set to music in two and three parts for the voice, harpsichord, and organ. Wesley's Psalm Book. Once again, Mr. Shank strikes out big. Also, um, concerning Charles Spurgeon, he's also used by Campbellites in this um, issue. Spurgeon was a man who didn't have instruments in his congregation at the, uh, the tabernacle in London. Um, however, he did not believe 
that using instruments was unlawful. For example, his comments on Psalm 33.2 states that we who do not believe these things, that is, instruments, to be expedient in worship, lest they should mar its simplicity, do not affirm them to be unlawful, and if any George Herbert or Martin Luther can worship God better by the aid of well-tuned instruments, who will gainsay their right? We do not need them. They would hinder, then help our praise. But if others are otherwise minded, are they not living in gospel liberty? So you misrepresented what Spurgeon actually believed. Why? And when you're called out on it, why do you continue to print this? Maybe you do want to lie on this issue. This last fifth issue, I also hold pretty dear to my heart because I am an avid student of Restoration history. And comments attributed to Randall by Mr. Shank here concerning the history of the Restoration Movement are extremely inaccurate. This review documents several of these. Um, for example, Randall says that Campbell was a Presbyterian who became a well-known Baptist preacher. Also, it says that uh, Campbell over time rejected his own Baptist creeds and his own Baptist doctrines when he discovered the Bible did not support them. The author of Muscle and a Shovel, a review, states here, I do not think Campbell would recognize himself in those statements. While it is true that after his immersion in 1812, his congregation joined the Redstone Baptist Association, they did so on the condition that they would not be bound by any creed. The Campbells never thought of themselves as owning Baptist creeds or Baptist doctrine. From the time of the Declaration of Address in 1809, they saw themselves as pursuing a non-denominational course, and they were interested in planting congregations shortly after the publication of that document. Campbell, in other words, had opposed the Philadelphia Confession of Faith even before he was immersed and associated with the Baptist Association. Mr. Shank, all of your comments are wrong. All of them. Why do you keep printing them? He goes on to state, At the same time, some of what Michael and Randall condemn as false doctrine in other parts of the story, and such that would render a group unfaithful, is actually affirmed by Campbell himself. In other words, other words the book participates in a kind of selective silence. For example, Campbell did not agree with Randall that the right reason for baptism is the remission of sins. Let that sink in, guys. He did not. The way Randall explains this was explicitly rejected by Campbell as destructive of the Restoration Movement, particularly as it was articulated by John Thomas. In addition, Campbell never said, like Randall did, that those and other denominations were headed for eternal destruction. Instead, he believed unimmersed believers who lived transformed lives would participate in the eternal kingdom. The God who has always enjoined upon man mercy rather than sacrifice, Campbell wrote, has never demanded baptism as an indispensable condition of salvation. That's from the Campbell Rice debate, guys. On another point, though Campbell would agree with Randall about weekly communion, free will offerings, and some other particulars about the church, he did not regard these things as tests of faithfulness of communion. In fact, in the Christian Baptist, he said he never made them, hinted that they should be or used them as a test of Christian character or terms of Christian communion. Mr. Shank, you've invented your own religion. Why? Last comments here on this issue. Concerning Alexander Campbell from the review book. The person who, in larger measure, began and led the Restoration Movement would himself reject the major premises of this book. 
that is muscle and a shovel. In that, Mr. Shank is saying that only those who have been immersed for the right reason, that is, for the remission of sins, have obeyed the gospel, and only those who comply with the marks of the true church outlined in the book, including the five articles of worship, are faithful Christians, while everyone else is headed to eternal destruction. Campbell would affirm neither of these premises that are at the heart of Mr. Shank's book. I know this is a longer video than I'm accustomed to posting, but this issue is of immense importance. I appreciate the uh, time that Mr. Shank took out to listen to my original uh, video concerning this issue. His response in the comments section to my original scoop are deeply troubling and concerning and I really don't think Mr. Shank wants the information brought out in Muscle and a Shovel a review out in public. This information threatens his livelihood as he's fond of stating he knows how many books he has sold and he also knows how many people have been um, said to have been baptized due to his work. Guys, if you're like me and you have an interest in reaching those of the Camelot perspective, this very faulty and error-prone book given by Mr. Shank needs to be addressed head-on, and the problems in the book need to be highlighted to anyone you come in contact with. And you need to ask the question, why? Do your Campbellite friends continue to promote this book? Why will Mr. Shank not correct the errors in his book? Why is he continuing to promote this work? I leave it to you as a viewer to decide. I don't know if what I would say would, say would uh, affect Mr. Shank in any way. But sir, I used to be where you were. I used to um, follow the same line of reasoning, use the same arguments, and have the same zeal. If you claim to be a lover of truth, if you want to fairly and accurately represent your opponent, you will have to pull this book from publication. Or you will have to make several corrections, footnotes, advertisements, whatever you need to do. I hope you consider seriously what I have to say, and I hope everyone who watches this is blessed by what has been delivered. Thank you for your time.